Welcome once again to May Journal Club for Vestibular First. We have our special guest, Danielle Tate, who's going to self-introduce like a rock star that she is. Hello, everybody. I'm Danielle Tate. I'm a vestibular physical therapist. I am obsessed with all things vestibular, self-proclaimed vestibuloholic. Um, over the years that I've been compiling resources and whatnot, I started a small little website uh, called vestibular.today, where I was also selling for a little while uh, 3D printed ear models of various sizes and uses. Um, I have also recently started a podcast called Talk Dizzy to Me, where I get to, to just sit down with one of my co-hosts and uh, pick the brains of clinicians in the field. So I'm very happy to be here today, especially with the Stimular First and Helena and Patrick. And I can't wait to talk about the article that we chose today. This is our article, Convergence Vestibulo-Ocular Reflex in Unilateral Vestibular Hypofunction. And they're doing a cool new idea about exercise, which we'll talk about here for VOR. So our background, first of all, it's good to know that um, a unilateral hypofunction is common. We certainly see it in clinic. Um, and we know that it impairs visual acuity, our dynamic visual acuity specifically. And unfortunately, that can lead to uh, some increased falls risk. And this has been well documented. And because this is the case, uh, we know that we usually would try to do gaze stability exercises. Hopefully, anyone who's taken the most basic of vestibular courses or gotten any instruction has learned good old VOR times one viewing, which would be the target is still, and we're moving our head side to side, like we're saying no quickly, as I like to say to my patients, <laughs> um, two to three hertz, something like that, right? So um, the goal would be to, of course, contribute to improvement in balance and decrease fall risk, and often also reducing dizziness, although that's not what was really specifically covered too much um, in this particular article, but that is something else that is often reported in this group. So quick review, what is VOR gain? So this is the amount of eye rotation relative to the amount of head rotation. So if my head's going to the left, my eyes are essentially going to the right to keep my eyes on a target that is kind of directly in front of me. Um, so normal would be roughly one, um, and that's a one-to-one -one ratio. The eyes are going a certain degree. You see the math up there in our, our, our picture. We all remember doing angles and sines and cosines. So cool. Um, <laughs> and then the absolute gain below 0.8 is considered pathological according to some research. So this is a sort of potential cutoff that we can use when we're thinking about you know, when people might have symptoms, essentially, whether that's impaired gaze stability and or dizziness, um, but certainly gaze stability is what they focused on in this study. So what is retinal slip? Because they talk about that quite a bit in the article. So it'd be good to kind of review that quickly. Retinal slip is the motion of the visual image on the surface of the retina, right? So that's kind of the back of the eye there. You see how they show the image on the retina um, in their in the, uh, picture they had in the article. Um, and basically, as that image moves across uh, the large portions of the retina, it's creating stimulus, right? So the brain's like, ooh, I got to keep my eyes on that, right? <laughs> ooh, what's that? I got to see that, okay? So we're trying to get everybody to work together. That's how I think of it. Um, and retinal slip is, in a way, good. It's, it's providing the stimulus um, for the brain to try to adapt in the case of someone with uh, vestibular hypofunction, okay? So um, math, retinal slip is a math problem. <laughs> also, lots of math in this article, if you're into that. Um, and that is ideal VOR gain minus actual. That's the retinal slip index to be specific. So essentially, we know that functionally, if there's too much retinal slip and people are really kind of struggling to keep that image in focus, we're going to blurred double uh, vision type image, OK? Not enough retinal slip in the case of training means we're not gonna get a change in VR gain over time. So this is the patient kind of walks around like Frankenstein, doesn't move their head, just kind of very little head movement, very slow head movement. You're not challenged sufficiently. That does not drive adaptation, okay? So hopefully this is all like, yeah, yeah, I know this, Lena, but if not, uh, hopefully it's helpful. So I just want to get everyone on the same page. There's a lot of terms in the article and I think it can get a little overwhelming even for someone who's been you know, studying it and learning it for a while, frankly. So it's kind of nice to me to review it. <laughs> um, studies have shown that convergence, right? So that's the eyes coming together for a near target, um, kind of uh, cross-eyed, as they say, if you kind of are bringing something towards you pretty close. 
Um, so converges the eyes during head rotation increases the VOR gain. So we'll talk a little bit about what that means because that was a pretty important piece of this article. I would say one of the kind of main points. So when you're rotating your head and you're looking at a near target, the angle of the eyes has to be greater than the angle of rotation of the head to maintain focus. So that increased angle of the eyes gives an increased velocity of movement. And again, that's more retinal slip, more stimulus. This is generally good in the sense of training, right? We want to provide the challenge to the brain that's sufficient to get adaptation, right? So in other words, the closer the target, the faster the eyes have to move, increase that VOR gain challenge. And that's good if you're trying to train someone who's had unilateral hypofunction, okay? Um, and they get, I found an example online, this is not in the article, but just kind of someone with Meniere's, which is kind of a classic potential uh, hypofunction, someone who's struggling to keep, you know, keep up, <laughs> right? Their eyes are not keeping up with that head movement as opposed to the healthy individual who does not have any vestibular hypofunction. So in this study, they only looked at 22 subjects with a hypofunction. So that's not a huge group. And they acknowledge that at the end of the article as a limitation and 12 healthy controls, mean age of 59. Um, and they had various causes of the unilateral hypofunction, but you know they were all pretty much confirmed um, because they did a bunch of testing, VHIT, um, VNG. Uh, they did do a clerks on a couple of people, but not the majority because VHIT is pretty good at this point. Um, most people acknowledge that from other studies. So we're not really worried about mis you know, misdiagnosing a hypofunction at this point if you've got a VHIT going. Um, they did do a brain MRI, again, just kind of ruling out any other central issues. Of course, they excluded some people with neck issues and things that would make it difficult to do the study the way they wanted to do it because if you hit, you know, to test someone's um, VOR gain and things, you're going to have to move that quickly. So things like neck problems, it's not going to go well with that. And that's a limitation for our patients sometimes. We could talk about that at the end, I think. But um, that was kind of the, the general sense of the study. You can kind of look, see more details in the article that I sent you or read this slide for more. Um, so then they did testing. So they did the V-hit, looking for corrective saccades that would be a way to assess for VOR gain. This all should fit together in our brains. And you can see how the kind of, um, kind of technology you're using for V-hit involves being able to see. So you can see that person can see out, they can see their target. And there's a little tiny camera that's positioned um, you know, to record um, with a sensor of the speed of the head movement and things like that. Uh, very cool technology, new-ish, but been out for a bit now. So they've got some good studies on it. So here they are kind of in the lab, I believe. <laughs> so they're doing a, a head rotation test to the clinicians behind them, doing that quick uh, head thrust if they need to for the V hit, and they're testing it with a, a dot on the wall that's relatively small, but still visible. And they looked at two distances. So a pretty uh, hefty distance of five feet, roughly 4.9, if you want to get specific. And then a very close distance of six inches. Um, and they didn't, I couldn't find in the article if it was like from the nose, but it was kind of my assumption. Um, so, I mean, I don't think the forehead makes much sense. So I was just trying to think what else they could mean. So, you know, roughly, you know, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Um, and then they gathered data for both sides. So the side of the lesion for the hypofunction and then the opposite side as well. And what they looked at was basically uh, finding, uh, the results, excuse me, were that the near target viewing on the ipsilesional side increased retinal slip. Um, and I'll break this down even more simply the next slide because I had to think about what that means, <laughs> uh, all these terms. And again, this is more likely to drive that VOR gain. So we want to be, you know, kind of viewing a near target, uh, particularly on the side with the lesion, okay? Um, they did show that some subjects show a partial recovery of their virgins enhanced VOR gain concurrent with recovery of passive VOR gain, which would be your far viewing. Um, and they felt that the significance of that was that it improved 10%, which is greater than the amount of change shown to be relevant to falls risk. I thought that was pretty critical piece of information. So that's 6%. They wanted to see a greater than 6% change in VR gain, and that's what they saw is a 10% was above that. So that's good. All right. And what is the ideal distance? A great question. We're gonna to get to questions momentarily. Um, they did specifically look at six inches, but they did not look at a wide variety of distances. So to say that six inches is ideal, um, I think I, I don't think that's fully proven, but what they showed is that to me, it's much closer than how I usually treat at least, which is I normally do about two feet. 
uh, our kind of arm's length, give or take. So they definitely had it closer than that at six inches, um, showed improved VOR gain. Okay, so great question on that. Uh, so on this slide, you'll see the big take home message for VOR times one exercise in a patient with a unilateral hypofunction, ideally you would encourage them to perform with a near target. So maybe you don't start them at six inches because that might seem too hard to them. It depends on the patient. Again, like we just adjust the speed and everything else to the individual. But if I had, um, I either can start at six inches if they're gonna tolerate that right out the gate or maybe I started a little further away and try to make that a progression. Um, and then of course we have to consider their convergence abilities and they address that in the article a little bit as well. Um, we wanna make sure that the patient also is turning their head past midline toward that affected side. Some people, when they learn VOR, they start to kind of get like a one-sided <laughs> motion going on. And we really want them to make sure at least they're getting past midline on the affected side. And maybe I don't care as much as they don't get past midline on the unaffected side of their hypofunction, but I definitely care about that affected side. So those are definitely two big take-homes to me. So six inches is kind of what they looked at. So um, again, I don't know if that's ideal, but that's certainly uh, what they suggested in the article is something they had actually looked at and shown gain. So that was good. So the pros of near target VOR training, in my opinion, uh, could be effective to increase the gain and reduce false risks. Yay. Now they didn't, it did acknowledge that more research of course should be done to really kind of confirm this. And I think hopefully to look at what would be ideal distances and things like that, but it's at least a start of kind of giving us a different way or maybe an adjustment on how we might normally be doing this activity um, and giving it for homework. Uh, I would definitely say it's a good progression again for people who maybe starting at six inches is difficult or something, then we could kind of start a little further back and then make it a goal to work closer to get that gain up better and you know, drive adaptation. And finally, I think it, it makes sense functionally for me at least because a lot of we do a lot of near work using our smartphones all the time and things like that. Um, so those are kind of things that resonated with me on the pro side. So Priti says near point of convergence is three to five inches. And that is true um, for someone who has normal convergence. And <laughs> we know that there are people who don't, and we're going to get to that in the, the challenges, but good point, Priti. Near point convergence is three to five inches. So let's look at the challenges um, as I see them, and we'll see uh, Danielle's input next. So the big one that jumped out at me, and I have a feeling that Danielle was thinking about the same thing and has ran into this perhaps in her practice. So we'll get her insight in a second here, but vision considerations, right? So anyone who's using bifocals, people with monovision, right? One eye that is supposed to be seen near and the other one is supposed to see far. And of course, good old convergence insufficiency, which you can see in patients with concussion, patients who have a congenital convergence insufficiency, patients who have, um, Migraine often have some convergence insufficiency at times, it can fluctuate. <laughs> so, you know, these are a few examples and I'm sure there are others. Um, so that's a, a consideration. I'll let Danielle kind of dig into that a little more shortly. Uh, and it's also to me less conducive to that kind of where I like to start them, which is seated in the chair, you know, target on the wall, super clean. <laughs> um, because trying to get the six inches, now I got to really scooch them close. And I don't love people holding the target. I know it's shown a lot in, in um, pictures and things, but I find that the challenge for some patients in holding their target is either their arms moving around. So we're getting an, an unexpected kind of randomized VOR times two activity, which is not always something that's appropriate for them, or you know they can't really fix their gaze properly and it just gets messy or they have a tremor or they're just they have shoulder pain or neck pain, <laughs> all these issues why holding a target is an issue. So I like sticking it on a post and on a wall. Um, so being able to do that and getting them six inches away from that, well, I'm going to like, what well, I have to lean forward to it. I don't know. There's some postural issues there. So it is a little bit, I'm going to be interested in Daniel's insights on that. And then I think the third challenge to me is again, kind of a little bit tying into the first one, I suppose, but potential to do induce headache in those with either an undiagnosed, particularly convergence issue <laughs> or, um, a migraine history that maybe they didn't volunteer or something. And, I just know with nearer targets, those folks sometimes get headache with near viewing uh, at a period of time. So, all right, I am done with my slides and that brings a handoff to Danielle. So my first question for Danielle was on which points do you agree or disagree with the authors of this article? Let's hear what Danielle has to say. So you definitely, I mean, hit everything <laughs> on the head um, with what, you know, we, it's scary how much in line we are with, with looking at some things. 
when I first came across this article, it popped up in one of my Google Scholar alerts, right? Because I'm a nerd and I like to get my updates when anything's coming out. So when I first read this, I was like, oh, well, that makes sense. I didn't even consider the fact that you have an increased gain with a closer target. Um, I just thought gain was gain, to be completely honest. I was like, oh, one is healthy and anything else is. But it was interesting. When I read the article, they found that ideally the gain should be 1.07 for your far distance and your gain should be 1.67 for mirror. So it was like this big light bulb moment for me when I read this. I was like, oh my gosh, that makes so much more sense. Like, of course, things are going to be a little bit more challenging up close because you've got so much uh, more of a difference in distance. Um, so it actually opened my eyes up to a lot. Um, there wasn't much that I disagreed with. Um, but again, I recognized some of their, um, their issues as far as what they recognize as, uh, you know, their, the, the distances are, I think just set because they were studying this and they had to keep things, um, set so they could study from person to person. Um, the big thing that kind of popped up in my head as soon as I started reading this was people with convergence insufficiency. We, I mean, it's very rare that we have somebody that comes in and they're perfectly fine with your convergence testing. Um, the way that I kind of viewed the article was, oh, this could be a great way to progress my patients. Um, not necessarily starting them um, from the get-go with that. Because a lot of times with your acute unilateral you know, loss patients, you can barely get them to sit and look at a target and feel comfortable <laughs> moving their head slowly, let alone bringing them in closely to focus. So that was like, oh, a lot. Like, yes. But also it was another light bulb moment for me thinking, oh, that makes sense why, you know, I can get somebody through vestibular rehab and they're varying their distances, but maybe not close. And they're still having some symptoms, you know, walking and talking with their friends, walking and looking at their smartphone, even on the golf course, if they're writing their scores down as they're walking to the next hole, they're having issues. So it's kind of like, oh, that's actually like a, a really good spotlight to shed on this, which I didn't recognize as a problem. But now too, this is actually a new tool in my toolbox that I can put into um, for treatment with my patients. So the way I kind of approached it initially was this is going to be a progression for those patients that have been with me for a while. They're like 95% better, but they're still like this little hump that they have an issue with like, um, running on a treadmill yeah. and being able to watch the TV on the treadmill or look at stuff on the treadmill and be comfortable with that. Um, I was like, Oh, well, why don't I give that a try first with these patients who have done really well, we haven't trained near. Let's see what that does. And these patients who went from doing a VOR exercise at almost full speed on foam standing up, all of a sudden we brought the target super close standing with a post-it note on a wall or something along those lines. And it became significantly difficult for them. A lot of them go, oh, like what, what is this? <laughs> so it was a nice little progression initially with my patients who had been with me for a little bit and were trying to progress um, from there. Um, and then from that point, I was kind of getting patients to start varying their distances. So maybe adding in on one of their multiple sessions a day to a closer target. And again, I'd make sure that they could do that standing because you are absolutely right with the sitting in a chair. We don't want patients leaning forward. We don't want them craning their necks or, or holding the card so much, but putting something on the wall. One question it did raise for me though, was should we be addressing potential convergence insufficiency issues if we felt comfortable with it? Um, you know, we're not specialized vision therapists, but we do have Brock strings in our toolbox and we can assess for convergence insufficiency. Should this be something that we address in combination with our vestibular therapy? What are your thoughts on that, Helena? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's risky business because even in concussion, there's been argument at least of whether we actually can change convergence versus it just kind of has a natural progression. And it certainly is been documented to be indicative of, you know, kind of how problematic um, the concussion is. In other words, like kind of how serious or if they're going to have more issues, and you know, the more impaired convergence is, it can be somewhat of a, a marker, but it's not as clear how much we impact it with treatment. Um, and I think that, that, of course, it's one of those kind of more research is needed things. There's a lot to look at um, with that. So I think why they're having impaired convergence is also a question. So again, if it's congenital, is that like a muscular issue? Like, can I really change that with training? Um, I'm always willing to try because I figure, you know, the odds of doing harm in most cases are low, but we do have to be judicious. So, you know, um, I think that the, the main thing too is, you know, is it causing them a problem or not? And maybe they don't know, 
but most of the time, you know, <laughs> it peaks up and then, you know, it's either at least, I don't know if they say they're having headaches at the computer, I always question it, or if they're saying that, oh yeah, I was working on the computer, I actually had a colleague that this happened to, his was congenital, but he had, he was self-correcting for a long time, and then I guess as he got older, essentially his, um, we'll say his brain maybe got tired of doing it, or the muscle got tired of doing it, or whatever happened, that he started um, getting a lateral drift of the one eye, um, and ended yeah. up needing surgery to correct it, which was very successful, so I think you know, uh, yes, I think if we're concerned about it or it's causing problems, we probably should look at it and maybe consider referring, of course, um, if it needs some sort of addressing. And then, you know, otherwise, I think, you know, again, there's no harm to me in treating and trying to get things closer. And then, you know, again, if something major like headache or something, I mean, like severe headache or something kind of comes up, then we can take a look at that and say, okay, well, what's the deal here? And that's absolutely um, so. different from patient to patient. Like when I was, when I took this, I saw the study and I took it into the clinic and started utilizing it in treatment. I didn't start everybody at the same distance. I didn't start them at the six inches. Um, we found a point that was close enough where I felt it was considered a near target. And the patient was instructed to make sure you can see your target, see it clearly, and that you don't, it doesn't double. As soon as it doubles, we would have to back up and readjust, but that distance was always different from patient to patient. What I found is just, we got so comfortable looking at VOR targets at arm's length and further. I never brought anything closer. Um, so that, so that's where I was kind of like, all right, maybe we need to look at this and, and use this to progress patients a little bit more differently. Good. We have something in the chat here that's yeah. from Pretty. She's got, it says, interesting point. Since I see a lot of concussion patients, I started assessing my vestibular clients with all the enhanced vision screening tests, which you can do, right? So if you're looking for phorias, tropias, mm -hmm. convergence insufficiency, um, BNO, what does that stand for? I can't, I'm blanking. Binocular. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, it's looking at different visual considerations. Oh, by nasal occlusion. Good call. Okay. Good call. Yes, I have the glasses for it. I, just, I don't know. I, don't, I guess I don't <laughs> abbreviate that one for some reason. You know, you either learn the abbreviations or you just always said the whole thing. Um, but anyway, so, and there can be some findings. And I think, again, for a variety of reasons, again, born that way, maybe they do have a history of old concussion, um, you know, kind of peeking around in there. Um, certainly folks with certain kinds of small cerebellar strokes, I have seen some of that stuff kind of peak up as well. So mm -hmm. a lot of possibilities. Text, textual visual aligning test. Oh, interesting. Let's look at that one later. Yeah. Oh, there's so many tests. Aliasing, not aligning. Oh my gosh, I can't even read tonight. Sad. All right. <laughs> very good. Very good input. Yeah. Well, for, um, it's definitely we something to that. take into consideration. Not that we have to treat it, right? We we pretty much have a vision therapist in our area in our back pocket to uh, refer people to because we know, like, we we don't really focus or after operate in that field um, as much. Um, but having that ability to screen for it, I think, is important because that could affect how you're doing with um, some of your therapies. I had a, a patient who actually has pretty bad diplopia and it made VOR training ridiculously hard. I, it was almost nearly impossible um, and varying the distance helped a little bit because, which makes sense now when I look at this article <laughs> that she could do VOR exercises from a further target and which became more challenging from a near target because of her um, diplopia and conversions insufficiency. Yeah. Uh, so we were still able to, to operate within some vestibular rehab aspect of exercises by using far targets, but near targets and rock strings, that was just a mess. And that was just something that we referred out to for vision therapy for yeah. because that's yeah. outside of my scope and my realm. Definitely. And don't be jealous, but I have a patient right now, poor um, patient, she's a, a bit older and she unfortunately had a fall so, and mm. they identified after time that she had had a concussion from it. And she has a history, because I have treated her for this already, of bilateral vestibular hypofunction. So that's fun. <laughs> Gee, why does she have double vision? I don't even know. Is it because her convergence is definitely impaired when I measure it? But I also know that she, her gaze stability, you know, of course, is not great because, she, I mean, it was okay when I released her. But like, you know, you're not going to get a bilateral, in my opinion, to be like better than four, maybe. Like, I don't know, three would be really lucky. Um, yeah. And uh, on top of that, now she's got this concussion, which was her central integrator, right? So like, I feel like she's probably, I don't know, I say lost her substitution adaptation, but you know what I'm saying? Like, so there's a lot like, going on there. Yeah, there's, there's a, lot a lot going, going on. on there. So yeah, yeah it's the hard. It's hard. <laughs> we, I have a colleague who is treating somebody who's blind, right? So where do you go with VOR for that? 
Uh, so imagine you know, in your head an X on the wall on a post-it note, if you will. <laughs> yes, yeah. So it's it's interesting uh, how yeah. we have to kind of get. Um, we have to be able to adapt and we have to be able to be willing to change things up a little bit, which is why I like the idea of journal clubs like this, because this forces us to read and listen to new stuff that pops up and potentially look at what we're doing and add some new things. to to how we treat our patients, this was definitely a, a, it's a very simple, simple (laughs) thing. And I can't believe, I don't know why I didn't, uh, uh, this didn't click sooner, but it makes so much sense. Yes. Oh, good. Uh, let's see. I'm getting a couple chats. I'm going to throw that in. Cheryl had the scenario. Uh, she used Ooh. sound for her blind patient to trigger the VOR. So like kind of like a metronome or maybe music. Yep. Those are good ones. And he can maintain gaze stabilization on a sound. Nice. Uh, Courtney likes the journal club. They're great. Uh, pretty saw a 13 year old with no eyes. How do we assist the vestibular system for you? That was hard. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, we thought telehealth was hard, <laughs> but these patients definitely bring a whole new meaning to challenge, but we got to get creative like we do. There's no studies on those folks, believe me, very few, maybe a case study. Um, so I want to wrap up our questions. You guys are doing great. Um, I love your input. So I think we kind of got, how could your information change practice? That was great. Tips applying it, uh, definitely have a good progression. And then in general, I just wanted to kind of think, what other tips could you provide to optimize patient outcomes, treating those tougher patients with hypofunction, unilateral hypofunction that just, I feel like I've had a few where it's just like, we get so close to the end. And then, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. um, some of that is, I, I, I think some of that is, um, patient expectation. Um, you know, a lot of people want to get back to 100% and how they were before. And, you know, there's always that 2% they can't quite get, um, for those patients, you know, I try to set expectations, but also you can try to challenge them in different ways. Um, I've just started dipping my toe into virtual reality. So nothing expensive, like the, I can think you can get a set of these goggles. They're like the $20 goggles that you can put the, um, your cell phone in. And mm-hmm. there's a lot of free apps where you can challenge them with motion sensitivity and just getting them used to visual conflict in a different way, putting them on different surfaces. Um, it's just been digging through new research and what people are doing, even on social media accounts and our, our shared Facebook pages where uh, other clinicians are sharing what they're doing. Um, that's been a huge help for me when it comes to trying to figure out how to help those patients in those extreme hypofunction situations, trying to get over that last finish line Mm -hmm. of getting them done with therapy. Um, but that's going to differ from person to person too, and exactly what's going on with them. Um, changing the, the target distance has been a big one because I just got so set on arm's length away. I mean, even, I mean, to be completely honest, I think we, I got got stuck in a rut and then I started doing far targets. And then I, now mm-hmm. after this article, bringing near and changing them, um, assigning a patient to change them throughout the day and make them a little bit more variable, um, get out of the comfort zone a little bit has been helpful. And then also making them functional. Like I have patients that I'll, um, I'll have them read captions on a TV in front of a treadmill while walking or doing a slow jog. We'll go out on the sidewalks in front of the clinic and have cars go past us while talking and reading something. Um, it's just, it starts to become a trial and error of what can we do to trigger their symptoms enough yeah. to the point where we can start to train that. Yeah. And I think I've had a few patients and I'm going to just jump in, um, with this question from the bot first and then get to kind of my last thoughts here before we wrap up. Um, you don't have to worry about not being able to see the presentation pretty because, um, I stopped sharing my screen, but all of this is recorded. It will be posted and anyone who kind of missed any part of it or wants to rewatch it. Um, we will have soup to nuts posted um, definitely on our website. Um, we'll probably have to convert the Zoom to a way that we can put it on YouTube, which I know Patrick can do. So we'll take care of all that. Don't worry. You will get to see it um, and hear it and all good. Um, so Labat did ask, how do you perform an ocular motor exam on a blind patient? And I think um, that is a great question. I will let Danielle put in her two cents first here. Sorry, because because I actually had a blind patient last week. I had no clue. <laughs> Basically, she has like artificial prosthetic on one side and then blind on the other side. So it's blind, blind. <laughs> yeah, so when you're looking at ocular motor, you're not necessarily having them follow a target, right? Because they're blind, no. but you're looking at range of motion, ocular motility. Um, I've, had a, I've had a couple of patients with artificial eyes where that's not going to 
we can't pay attention to that one. That's not going to do too much. Um, and I've had some patients who um, are severely impaired through cataracts or injury, and mm-hmm. I'll ask them to look in the directions, um, look as far as you can to your right, look as far as you can to your left, look up, look down, um, and look what their ocular motility is. But as far as saccades and, and um, tracking and things like that, that'd be a little bit more difficult since they can't view a target unless they have some partial sight. Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those cases uh, where you're definitely getting a, getting a sense <laughs> rather than like a full, but then again, in a way, it's gonna sound maybe weird to say, it's good for diagnostics, but less important to their function in a way, they're not leaning on their vision, right? So like, you know, that kind of integration of the visual system is <laughs> not really as relevant. <laughs> um, so, you know, we're worried more, I think about, um, you know, of course getting a good diagnosis because they could still have BBB or something. So trying to get a sense of if there's any of that going on you're a little heavier probably on symptoms for uh-huh. sure, which is suggested here by Courtney as well. Um, you know, and then just trying to get your best pieces of information to see what fits. Um, Cheryl suggesting mm-hmm. testing um, VOR and HIT with her blind patient looking towards her while she hummed. So trying to give like again that. that kind of sound-based, you know, cues to try to kind of elicit um, some of those. Uh, so that's a really great tip. Uh, that's awesome. Crazy. We learn we learn something new every day. I know. That's why we like journal clubs, so we can get the ideas from all the smart brains out there that you guys have. Um, so yeah, I um I would just say that conclude that, that there are often other barriers to people with unilateral hypofunction improving, and the two big ones I've noticed are neck issues, ah. um, and then I'll say kind of that emotional support that they need. Um, so that category. So kind of finding different resources, whether it's, you know, meditation apps or whatever, um, you know, and just kind of even just working them through. Like I had a patient who was an ICU nurse and he was very anxious about going back to work and being able to operate at that high level demand. Um, and so I had tasks for him. Like I have this floor mat with all these alphabet letters on it. I have this so many kids games that I repurpose for vestibular care. <laughs> and, um, I was like, hey, I want you to run. You're going to bend down because that was provoking to him a little bit still was kind of that bend down come up, which I'm sure a lot of patients with various vestibular conditions, that's like pretty stimulatory, right? Reticular system and all that. So he had to bend down, tap out. And I wanted to spell like pulmonary edema. So you had to like bend down, tap the P, then come up then bend down and tap, tap the U and come up. This is this like kind of like more habituation, I admit, but I had him doing it quickly. Um, with a lot of kind of movement and turning. And I was like, look, like, this is like you, okay, I got to bend down, check this line. I got to come up and, you know, check this, whatever, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I'm like, it's way more than what you'd probably have to do on repeat. Um, and that's good. Like that, everything should always be harder in therapy than what you have to deal with in the real world. That's what I tell my patients. Like you should be like, oh, this is easy compared to what Helena had me doing yesterday. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that way real life is not hopefully a problem for them. I think um, habituation is really important for those type of function patients because they've gotten so used to, to the compensatory motion of avoiding the things that trigger a response. So that could be that missing link and aspect to their therapy that adding in the habituation is significantly important because they're avoiding it because they're symptomatic. So I think it's absolutely, absolutely right thing to do. Right, right. I know like kind of textbook, it's like, oh, you got to adapt, don't habituate. But I think at the end of the day, it's about movement. Um, and kind of, again, what you do, like you said, kind of what stimulates them and what challenges their brain to kind of work to hopefully, you know, be successful at the task. And so Cheryl put in also that her patient, um, had ended up having BBBV, which she based off the symptoms because he didn't have nystagmus. Um, and that's a little tricky because I think, you know, again, when that visual system is less integrated, I don't know, like at that point, whether you do lose some of that kind of actual motor input because it's just not being used on a regular basis. That's just a theory on my part, Cheryl, no research on that. I'm just spouting out here, but um, yeah, it is tricky um, obviously for these unique patients with uh, blindness or um, kind of not really being able to rely on their visual system, how we kind of assess them for all things where it's BPV or saccades or what have you. So really cool take home message, do nearer targets with your patients with VOR exercises. (laughs) Um, uh, Courtney put in, I've used VOR for habituation, which I think most of us have. Um, when their dynamic visual acuity is recovered, but you know, kind of they're at that two or three line difference, but they're still symptomatic. And I think, again, that just makes sense. It's just kind of, again, whether it's just not that measurable at that point with dynamic visual acuity, not as sensitive enough to, to, to measure these more subtle differences these patients are feeling or more, I call it still learned dizziness or learned you know, symptoms where the patient's just kind of still kind of feeling them, remembering them, whatever you want to call it. 
those pathways are there, as I like to say. So we just kind of keep reshaping them to, you know, hopefully be, um, you know, not noticing them or not feeling them or kind of being able to feel confident with their movement. So, all right, this is great. I apologize for all the technical issues in the beginning, but we got it together. We recorded this, this will be posted. So if you missed any part of it, no worries. Um, and if anyone didn't get the article or needs it again, feel free to, you know, shout out on social media or email me directly at Helena, H-E-L-E-N-A at vestibularfirst.com. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate all your input and I will try to get this up as soon as I can. So hope you learned something or got something out of it. And thank you, Danielle, for your time. You're our very special guest. Thank you. Thank you. It was fun to be here. All right. Thanks. All right. Everyone saying thank you. How much? Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Helena. Bye, 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 pretty. Very cool.